You might have caught wind of this story. Sorry, the worst puns, wind, because there's also solar involved and there's some other things. Uh, The government of Canada, in its uh, desire for all things green, announced a clean technology investment tax credit. And a lot of us who are big proponents of nuclear power were delighted to see SMRs, or small modular reactors, being covered in that federal investment tax credit. Because there are some pretty ardent anti-nukes in the Trudeau cabinet, including people like John Wilkinson, who has been uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, also very involved in this. But you've finally taken this leap of faith. The government acknowledges seemingly that so-called clean technology that will replace ultimately coal and natural gas and fossil fuels can be found in nuclear. But an interesting op-ed piece written recently by the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy says the government has dropped the ball. There is Canadian technology available in the can-do reactors that are not being acknowledged. Chris Kiefer is a physician. He's an emergency room doc in Toronto. And he's also a director of a group called Doctors for Nuclear Energy. We find Dr. Kiefer in Toronto this morning. Chris, welcome aboard, and thanks for taking our call. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's great to be chatting with, uh, with Saskatchewan this morning. Now, you do, of course, point out in your op-ed about the uh, uranium-rich, the world's richest uranium mines, of course, in Saskatchewan. You know, absolutely, and this is a real undertold story. Um, you know, we're, we're so conscious of our emissions. Um, there's a lot of talk about offsetting emissions and things like that. And Canada is an absolute clean energy powerhouse, not only here at home with our hydroelectricity and our nuclear fleet, uh, but also internationally. You know, we produce about, depends on the year, 10 to 13 percent of the world's uranium. Well, that offsets one-third of Canada's total all-sector emissions. We produce about 730 megatons of CO2 every year. That uranium avoids 230 megatons, um, which would otherwise be produced by coal and gas plants around the world. But because of our global nuclear fleet, uh, that is offset. So, you know, that's a remarkable success story of the sector that is just not being told. Um, And so, you know, our group helps, I think, bring some of those facts out and communicate in a way that sometimes the industry potentially drops the ball on. You know, it's interesting. Even here in Saskatchewan, we've had, gosh, since the 70s, uh, they are getting older and older now, but a very outspoken anti-nuclear lobby. You know, and beyond industry players, I don't bump into a lot of Canadians who say, you know, I am a Canadian for nuclear energy. So how did you get involved in this? Never mind doctors for nuclear energy. What's the backstory? Sure, yeah. I mean, so as you mentioned, I'm a a physician. I have a long activist record, you know, previously more on human rights issues. Um, I was a staff physician at the Canadian Centre of Victims of Torture, for instance. So those were my issues going back. But when my son was born, you know, this generation, when we have kids, we start thinking about climate change a fair amount because our time skills go from our own selfish lives, you know, 80 years into the future, hopefully, with our children's lives. And so I started looking into climate change and got pretty worried about it. Um, But not being a doomer and wanting to stay optimistic and hopeful, I started looking at what the solutions were. And right here where I live in Ontario, um, we have achieved what we are all aiming to around the world, which is a deeply decarbonized electricity grid. And we've done that with nuclear. 61% of our electricity comes from nuclear. And, you know, we used to be 25% coal. Um, We use nuclear for 90% of the electricity we needed to phase out coal. Um, And, you know, in so doing, have saved thousands of lives every year from avoided pollution. Now, we still have coal on the grid, particularly in provinces like Saskatchewan, which don't have all the hydroelectricity of their neighbors like Manitoba or, you know, Quebec or B.C. You know, some of those provinces are very lucky and endowed with seemingly endless hydro resources. But, you know, for provinces like Ontario, like Alberta, like Saskatchewan, um, this is a proven route. And we're, we're being sold, you know, a bill of false goods saying that we can do it with wind and solar. You just can't replace, you know, something like a coal plant, which puts reliable electricity out on the grid, which we need, you know, to keep our hospitals going 24 hours a day or to run the industry, which underpins our generous, you know, welfare state. You need to be producing stuff, building stuff, making stuff. For that, you need reliable electricity. Um, So, you know, it started really as a climate concern. I still am very climate and air quality concerned as a physician. Air quality has a big impact on human health. But it's turned into as well just a concern about Canada's economic future. Because, listen, I mean, the wealth of a country really determines the health of a country. So, 
nuclear answers a lot of questions across the board, and you know that's that's the story of my motivation, I guess. Dr. Chris Kiefer with us in Toronto, physician, president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. So I'm curious on this uh, clean technology investment tax credit. Uh, Saskatchewan is pursuing fairly actively small modular reactors, uh, of course, with Cameco, the world's largest uranium company in Saskatchewan, having recently acquired half of Westinghouse. I mean, we're getting pretty bullish here on nuclear generation. But your argument is that this clean technology tax credit has actually ignored the existing can-do technology. What's the story there? Well, I mean, Canada is a very special country. You know, we punch above our weight in engineering, and one of our top 10 engineering achievements, as formerly ranked, is the Candu reactor. And that's the basis of our entire existing nuclear industry. You know, it's certainly exciting that we're looking at bringing on SMRs. We need smaller reactors for the smaller grids in our country, like that in Saskatchewan. But... As of now, um, our entire industry is a can-do industry. And so with this clean technology investment tax credit, you have these generous subsidies being given out to, frankly, unviable energy sources like wind and solar. And that supply chain is almost entirely in China. Seven of the ten largest wind uh, turbine manufacturers are Chinese. The European ones are going under and moving their operations to China. And 97% of solar wafers, which are integral to making solar panels, are produced in just one country, China. Right. So if we're going to be spending tens of billions or even hundreds of billions of dollars on an energy transition, we have a choice. We can shovel that money and a big trade deficit over to China, become a nation of low skilled workers installing kind of finished products, you know, wind turbines and solar panels, which are going to create a grid that's unreliable and inconsistent with a productive industrial economy. You know, or we can invest in the technology that we invented where the supply chain is 96% made in Canada, which means we harvest the entire economic benefit of those investments. But this clean technology investment tax credit is actually, it's almost a form of reverse protectionism. We're punishing Canadian industry and stimulating the Chinese economy. You know, so it's, it, is, it is encouraging that SMRs are included within this mandate. But here's another issue. All of the utilities looking at deploying SMRs are public utilities. They don't benefit from a tax credit. So in the end, nuclear is not even included in this. Um, and that's, that's a major problem you know, for, for climate action, for air quality, and for the Canadian economy. That's a good point. Chris Kiefer is with us, a physician in Toronto, uh, the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Uh, help me out on what still remains the largest, and I would argue the only objection now, but there are others, to nuclear energy, and that, of course, is spent fuel. How do we deal with that environmentally, responsibly, and sustainably? I mean, we've been doing an excellent job. You know, don't get me wrong. When, when spent nuclear fuel comes out of the reactor, it's really dangerous stuff, right? We have to shield it carefully, but we're really good at it. You know, in a modern society, we make dangerous things safe. Just think about taking a, an airplane ride somewhere. You're flying at 30,000 feet, pretty close to the speed of sound. I mean, that is an objectively dangerous thing to do. You're in an airplane with 10,000 mission-critical moving parts. But, you know, shielding nuclear waste is actually pretty easy. You have to keep it underwater for five or ten years, and then you put it into a concrete and steel container. You know, uranium is three million times more energy dense as something like coal, which means we produce three million times less waste, which means we can store it all on site. You know, in Ontario here, our nuclear facilities have these waste storage facilities. They're spick and span. They look like a Costco warehouse with a number of, you know, concrete and steel containers, and that's where the fuel's been. And in the history of civilian nuclear waste management, there's not been a single death um, associated with, with management of that fuel. The other neat thing about it, you'll hear the antis talking about how, you know, nuclear waste is forever waste. It's absolutely not. You know, that radiation goes away really quick. 99.9% .9 of the radioactivity is gone in 20 years. And so in something like 500 years, you can actually hold a spent fuel bundle in your hand. It won't hurt you you're returning it to the level of radioactivity of the ore from which it was mined. And so we've made a mountain out of a molehill out of this waste as we continue to pollute our atmosphere with CO2 and particulate, which is, you know, having real impacts. And, you know, the environmentalists are frankly scoring an own goal on themselves, <laughs> speaking of the World Cup right now, yeah. um, because, you know, they're fighting what is our cleanest source of electricity, our lowest carbon source of electricity. It's, it's bonkers. And, I mean, that's what motivates me, I think, is, 
you know, being a communicator and someone who's fought for the underdog in the past, like for refugees and torture survivors, um, I think this is an underdog battle that is massively misunderstood. And I'm passionate about communicating and trying to educate the public on it. Never mind, closer to your professional interest, medical isotope development. Absolutely. And again, I mean, that's a real strength of our made in Canada uh, can do technology. We produce enough cobalt 60, a critical medical isotope, to sterilize 40% of the world's single use medical devices. So that's things like the IV cannula, the blood draw tubes, the PPE, everything that's critical to keeping a hospital sterile. We do that in our power reactors. So we're not only making, you know, ultra clean electricity, producing a tiny, easy to manage waste stream, um, but we're saving lives every day in the hospital. Um, so, I mean, yeah, obviously yet another reason. And when people, you know, are opposed to things like, you know, we're refurbishing our reactors to get another 30, 40 years out of them, when they're opposed to that, I just, I don't understand it because they don't have a leg to stand on for their supposed environmental concerns for air quality, for climate, but also for things as humanitarian as, you know, keeping our hospitals sterile and having cancer treatments. So, you know, the antis, I think, have really um, diminished um, as, you know, folks like myself and others passionate about this technology are starting to get out there and communicate, you know, on radio shows like your own. Great meeting you today, and I know you and I will talk again soon, I hope. If people want to learn more about Canadians for Nuclear Energy, what are the best coordinates? Yeah, pretty easy to remember website. Um, it's c4ne.ca, and that four is the number sign. Um, we have an active petition right now before the House of Commons, and that is to include our entire nuclear sector, our can-do nuclear sector, within that uh, clean technology investment tax credit. So if your listeners are looking for a way to concretely make a difference, head over to that website, and we'll have the petition uh, link there any minute. Great chatting. Thanks so much, Chris. All the best, and keep up the good work. All right. Take care, John. Chris Kiefer in Toronto.